I'm, uh, again, very happy to be here with you today. Um, I'm here to showcase how IDEAL and HTA, Health Technology Assessment, can fit together. I don't think we have the answers quite yet, but at least we're making progress and we can start to see that alignment. It's thrilling to be here to, to see a full two days being dedicated to IDEAL, and I'm very, very hopeful, uh, just judging from the interest that I'm seeing on Twitter, that there are a lot of people around the globe who are ready to uh, increase or enhance uh, the reliability of the evidence base around surgical procedures and medical devices. Uh, first of all, I'm going to use this, just a standard disclosure slide. So I've been at Cadiz. I was going to say that's Canada's equivalent to NICE, but given Carl's talk, maybe I don't want to make that reference. Um, I've been at Cadiz for about uh, 13 years now. Cadiz has been around for 30 years. And uh, just in the interest of full disclosure, Cadiz now uh, receives most of its funding from the federal government and also uh, our provinces and territories. In the past few years, we've started to receive application fees from pharmaceutical companies when they submit a dossier to us for, for review, so just in the interest of disclosure. So Cadiz uh, is an independent, not-for-profit organization, so despite the fact that we're funded primarily by government, we do sit outside of government. Uh, we're asked to take on work. We do so independently, and what we come up with is actually posted on our website for all, all to see. Um, we are not the decision makers, so we do the evidence synthesis work, we provide the advice, and then we hand that over uh, to the, those who, who work in the jurisdictions, uh, whether that is provincially at a regional level or at a hospital level, to actually make uh, those funding decisions. And we cover drugs, medical devices, surgical procedures, programs, tests, pretty much everything that uh, you can imagine. So just a reminder, in case uh, some people aren't familiar with HTA, I know we've got a, a wide-ranging community here, but I have uh, put up this definition, a little note, that there is an international group now working to revise the definition of HTA, but I think still at the core of all of this is the fact that we're looking at evidence. We're looking at as to whether something actually works. Um, and again, it's always comparative, so we're, unlike our regulator, uh, which doesn't always do comparisons against an active comparator, we're looking at the standard of care. So is something new actually better than what we're already doing in terms of clinical safety and effectiveness? We also look at the value for money element, so cost effectiveness. We look at the affordability element. So just because something works and is cost effective, it might actually not be affordable uh, for our system in terms of the budget impact. We're looking at those trade-offs, so the opportunity costs, and we're also looking at, in an HTA, what else needs to be considered. So are there issues around uh, training, uh, health human resources? Um, in Canada, uh, we have a rural, remote, urban, rural split. So we want to be able to address, or at least not exacerbate, existing inequities. So we're really looking at evidence from a lot of different places, and we're trying our best to make sense of it, in a really fast timeline. Uh, just to give you an idea, when I started at Cadiz, we were taking about 18 months-ish to do a health technology assessment. We're now being asked to deliver in six months. So that pressure is there. Um, the stakes are higher, and the evidence base is probably uh, larger and more complicated than it was before. At Cadiz, we're pretty proud of the, our new strategic plan, and uh, you can find this on our website. Um, this has been a few years in the works, and effectively what this is showing is that we're moving from being, being an, uh, an HTA, so a health technology assessment body, to one that is actively supporting our healthcare systems to better manage technology. So you might hear me talk about HTM, so health technology management, instead of HTA. Of course, health technology assessment, or HTA, is still at the root of all of this. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to here is what's in that little um, middle oval, where we're really moving forward with a life cycle approach to health technology assessment. So life cycle of a device, of a drug, means doing assessments at various time points. 
And I think we've learned this uh, from the regulatory landscape, which again uh, looks at uh, technologies at different points in the life cycle. So I've just taken that slide and kind of flipped it around so that you get an idea of the various phases of the life cycle that we're looking at. And I should say that we're not the only HTA body that's doing this. Uh, we do tend to get involved now uh, more so with companies before they launch uh, their, their sort of pivotal trial. So we're talking to companies, we're talking to innovators, and providing them with the perspectives of an HTA body and the payer. So what kind of outcomes do we look for? Well, we look for different things than the regulator, um, but at least you know we're, we're having that conversation early on with the hopes that the, the innovators uh, can collect the data that we're looking for uh, and include it in their evidentiary package uh, as it moves along. The next stage, so managed entry, another word for adoption or, or, or sort of um, system entry, is the place where HTA has traditionally been preoccupied. Um, this is what we do. A new drug comes to market, we're going to do the assessment, similar for medical devices. But what people have realized is that sort of one-off, you know, the gate is open, the gate is closed decision is likely not helpful. And so what we've been asked to do is devote more of our efforts, and I don't know where those efforts are coming from, but that's a conversation for later, is to actually take a look at things that are already in the system and determine whether or not what we initially thought when we gave that first approval is actually panning out. And of course, you know, one of the uh, endpoints of a decision to reassess can be that something is replaced by something new. We're also making sure that we're taking a look not only at a particular widget or thing or drug, but we're looking at it within the context of a whole care pathway. So uh, a single technology assessment, a traditional health technology assessment in and of itself is necessary but not sufficient to support health technology management, uh, at least in the way that uh, we're hoping to be able to enable our system. And of course, all of this is really predicated on engaging with people who are in this space. Um, I can say years ago when I started at Cadith, I would not be talking to industry. Just, we would not be there, we would not be at the same table, and we certainly wouldn't be helping each other uh, with our work, if you will. So I would not be telling a company, you know, I really need data on overall survival not progression-free survival, I can have that conversation now. And so it certainly um, enriches the quality of our discussions to have the stakeholders engaged throughout. Now yesterday I shared a few articles that have appeared in the literature just so that people know that this isn't something that we've cooked up at Cadith on our own. I mean, obviously you're here, you know about the ideal collaboration and the many years of work that's gone into this. Uh, but we're also seeing some publications coming uh, from health economists, so this one in particular. Um, a couple of Canadians uh, in there, and they are actually pointing the finger at themselves, saying health economists and health technology assessment analysts could make a more significant contribution to system efficiency through rebalancing their efforts away from technology adoption questions toward technology management issues. So again, what's the sweet spot? And do we actually have enough capacity to do this work? Those remain unanswered questions. Another group in Canada, uh, this group out of the University of Calgary has been doing a lot of work in the health technology reassessment space. Um, again, this is not new to Canada. This is building on efforts the Choosing Wisely campaigns, the Less is More, Slow Medicine, a recognition that if you want to actually, you know, create some headroom in your budgets uh, to acquire those new innovations that are going to be, uh, going to be backed by an evidence base to support that, you probably have to get rid of some of the things that are in the system and not delivering on that same value equation. So Fiona Clement's group uh, has been working on this for a few years, and in fact, the province of Alberta and the province of British Columbia 
have implemented this process. So I would say keep your eyes peeled for work coming out of here. Um, again, still early days. I suspect it's going to be difficult to withdraw things from the system. Um, probably more difficult than letting things in. But they do have a, you know, a process and they have a number of uh, champions in play. And of course, I, I, I wouldn't be able to uh, talk about this sort of phased or ecosystem approach without referring to work by Julian Elliott, who I think is at the guidelines meeting right now and will be up at Cochrane uh, next week. But again, there's a lot of people thinking about the need uh, to kind of build in these, you know, a loop actually, a feedback loop where you make an initial decision because again, decisions have to be made. We can't put those off until you've got the perfect evidence base. Politics doesn't operate that way. But as you make a decision, you can ensure that you've got additional or adequate additional data collection mechanisms that then can feed back into those decisions. So I like this particular schematic because it does reflect the importance of primary research as well as the evidence synthesis work that goes into that space. So I changed my one slide from yesterday so that uh, pe people who were here realized that I was trying to match ideal to HTM. And uh, I think I've, I've now mapped it out a little bit. I'll look to Yannicka and Maruska to give me feedback as to whether I've got these right. Um, but for those folks uh, who are familiar with the stages of ideal or ideal D, where we've added in the preclinical, you can now see where it maps to this thing that we're calling HTM. So right now, I don't think that there's any role, at least one that's been defined for HTA or HTM in the preclinical space. That's really just probably too early for us to comment, and I'm not sure that we would be able to give anything that would be valuable. But once you get to stage one, and I'd say 2A, that's a role for early HTA. And I'm going to point out, Yannicka, where are you, Yannicka? Way, OK, way over there. If you do want to talk more about early HTA, she's in the know. She's been doing quite a bit of work in this space. And this is, it's really interesting, because this is actually starting to use decision modeling and health economics at a very early stage to actually inform a go, no-go decision for a technology developer. So usually this is happening later where we, you know, we have something that wants to come to market and we give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If we're able to use similar thought processes earlier on, it can probably help people make a decision as to whether or not this is worth going for. Is it going to be better than what we have? And in order to be better than what we have, at what price do we need to, uh, to set that? Ideal phase 2B fits very nicely with scientific advice or early dialogues. And these have been going on, particularly for the pharmaceutical companies, for quite a number of years now. Uh, Canada, maybe because we're you know, cold for six months of the year, we've been a little late to the game. Uh, but NICE, Cadeth, uh, UNETA, the European Union's network for HTA, uh, the Excite International Program, all do this now where we do meet with technology developers in a room and have a conversation about what kind of data do we need. So again, this is coming back to data, 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 data. We can even have conversations um, about what we would look for in a post-market space. So thinking about RCT versus real-world evidence, happy to have those conversations. I should note that, that uh, those scientific advice early dialogue conversations are non-binding and they're confidential. And I think that they haven't been going on long enough for anyone to actually know, maybe other than the companies, whether the advice that they're receiving is actually making a difference. Stage three of IDEAL uh, is just our, our regular, typical, run-of-the-mill HTA, where we're focused in on the clinical, economic, financial, ethical, legal, social, and implementation issues. So again, a whole lot of evidence coming in there to support a decision. And then, of course, with the fact that we will be doing more in the reassessment space, because many of our recommendations are going to be conditional 
So this is something new for Canada, conditional or you know, coverage with evidence development recommendations. We're going to be asking for additional evidence. We're going to specify what kind of evidence we need. Um, and then we're going to come back and revisit that. Um, so again, at this point, this is plans. It's in the plans. We're working up the actual processes. Next year will probably be the year where the rubber hits the road. Uh, I just had slides for each of those. But just in the last few seconds, I just wanted to uh, maybe wrap up. So you're here today, which is wonderful, which means that you're, you're having the information you need. And I just wanted to say sort of forewarned is forearmed. So um, HTA, again, is bringing together evidence, lots of evidence, including evidence of learning curve. We'd like to know about when things don't go well. We'd like to know what else is required if we have to redeploy uh, human resources. I would dare say that with this life cycle approach, while things might be able to come into the system earlier uh, than usual, there is still that expectation that we're going to need evidence. And in fact, uh, that expectation is going to be reinforced uh, not only through uh, our funding recommendations, but also our regulatory authority. And finally, uh, again, IDEAL and HTA, I think, can enhance the coherence and efficiency of this ecosystem. And I'm looking forward to hearing examples. I think we have someone from the Scottish Health Technologies Group here who actually says that in their reports, they indicate which phase of IDEAL uh, study that they're doing. We have some challenges with that, so I'd be looking forward to having that discussion with you. Happy to answer a few questions or over lunch. Thank you. <laughs>